Thinking about calling. Now, you know, Christianity, when we talk about being a Christian, I think we really lose, and many people lose the perspective of what it means to be saved. If you're saved, you're called. Now, you might not be called to be a pastor or a preacher. You might not be called to be an evangelist or a missionary. But we're all called. We all have a purpose. That God doesn't save us. He doesn't make us believers just for the purpose of, like, hanging out in church on Sunday morning. But he gives us a calling. Some people he sends around the world. Some people he sends next door. But we're all called. And I want to this morning just look a little bit at a calling. Uh, one of the major players in the New Testament. The author of two-thirds of the New Testament was the Apostle Paul. I may know the history of the Apostle Paul. Paul, whose name was Saul... Uh, it, when we first meet him, he used the name Saul, or the Bible used the name Saul, was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. He was a powerful man. He was seated on the Sanhedrin, which was the governing body of the Jews at that time. And he was zealous of good works. He was zealous of God. He was zealous for the law. And when this bunch called this, the Christians came along, he got so righteously indignant with this, with this bunch that dared to believe in this Nazarene, this guy from Galilee, that he, he not only didn't like him, but he purposed in his heart to wipe him out. Saul hated, they weren't called Christians then, they were called the way pen. But he hated him, okay? So if you look at first the book of Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read a little bit this morning. We have prepared the Lord's table. Uh, all who are saved or invited to partake of the Lord's table. Our only requirement, you don't have to be a member of our church. All you need to do is be born again and saved. And we'll talk about that when we get there. In chapter 9 of the book of Acts, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And he desired of him letters to Damascus. Some of us know the story to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether there be, they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. He got some bench warrants. Some of you know what those are. <laughs> bench warrants. And, and he said, I'm, I'm going to hunt these. I, I'm not just happy with hunting them down here in Jerusalem, but I'm going to, I heard there's a bunch of them in Damascus. Give me some bench warrants. I'm going to go and drag them back here. And we're going to get them straightened out. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, there shined around, uh, around about him a light from heaven. And when he saw this light from heaven, he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you doing this, Saul? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Saul recognized that this personage that was speaking to him was a Lord. It wasn't a ghost. It wasn't an apparition. But he recognized him as Lord. Didn't know his name at that point, but he knew he was Lord. When you, listen, when you come in contact with Jesus Christ, you know. When you come in contact with God, you know. You might never have picked up a Bible, but I'll tell you one thing. You run into God and you're going to know it's Him. He's going to make sure you know it's Him. Paul knew the Bible, or Saul knew the Bible inside. He knew the Old Testament inside, not. But he didn't know who this person was. He says, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He says, Paul, how long, Saul, he says, Saul, how long are you going to keep resisting? How long are you going to keep resisting my, my embrace, my, my pull, my... My magnificent. How long are you going to resist the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart? And that same question, I think we could all ask that question of ourselves at one time or another in our lives, and maybe even right now, you've been trying so hard to resist the influence of God in your life. And you know what? The harder you try, the harder it gets. Amen? You know, and thank God for that. Because if it, if it ever gets to the place where it's, 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 it starts getting easy, you better... <laughs> if it starts getting easy to resist God, man, you better get on your face and cry out. Because that means your conscience is getting serious. See? 
But listen, he wasn't going to let Paul go. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? What a, what a, what a question. What a, what a prayer. What will you have me to do? What, what do you want from me? He didn't have a clue as to what was coming. But he knew he was talking to the Lord. He knew he was talking to Jesus, whom he was persecuting. He said, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. God made him go blind. He made him get to the place where he couldn't see nothing else. The last thing he remembered seeing was that light from heaven. I guess maybe God wanted him to remember that light from heaven. I guess maybe he didn't want him to get distracted with the stuff going on to the right and to the left and the things happening. He wanted that, that, that vision burned in his brain for the rest of his life. So they went to Damascus. And in verse 10, And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in the vision, Ananias. He got called. Now this Ananias was nobody special. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't a prophet. You don't hear about him after this uh, segment of scripture. We know nothing of him. He was just a guy named Ananias in Damascus who was saved. And God called him. And he said, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prays. And has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. God's orchestrating this whole thing out of nowhere, just like the thing with Ralph and his wife. He's orchestrating this whole affair. Taking a, a part here and a part here. He's calling somebody here and calling somebody here. And he's making them come together. I mean, that's the way God does things. He doesn't do them according to the way we think it ought to be done. You know, if I was planning this thing out, I would have the whole scenario just kind of mapped out and everybody... Well, I, you know, we don't know, but God knows. Ananias, after he heard that, he said, Lord, he's coming to arrest me. This guy wants to put me in jail. I heard all about him. You want me to go, you know, which was a pretty reasonable question, I guess. He says he's here and he has authority from the chief priest to bind all the call on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go your way, for he is a what? A chosen vessel. I want to tell you something. If you're called, you're chosen. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're chosen for something. Don't you know, Satan will come along and tell you you're nothing. God doesn't have nothing for you to do. If, you, if Christ is dwelling inside of you, you have been called and chosen for something. It might not be to preach to a million people. It might be to share the gospel with one person who is called to preach to a million people. This Ananias, we never heard of him since then. We don't know what ever happened to him. But we know what happened to Saul. Or Paul, right? He became the Apostle Paul. He says, Go thy way, for he's a chosen vessel, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must what? Nobody, I'm, I'm thankful. I'll be honest with you. If God would have give, played a videotape or a DVD of the things that I, that I would go through when I first started in ministry, I'd still be working in Allegheny Level. <laughs> I'm just telling you the way it is. If God would have shown me, you know, 20 years ago, well, here, here's the way it's going to go down. You know, and I thank God there's been a lot of great blessings in ministry and so forth, but then there have been a lot of struggles. And if I'd have seen all that, I probably would have said, well, you know, Lord, uh, if you mind me, can I just pass on this one? <laughs> can I just maybe just take it? Maybe, maybe that fellow across the street might want to do this. Okay, but Paul, he, he was there. He was blinded. He was, he was shaken. I mean, his life was so, he was so bent on destroying the members of this way, and now he has become one of them. Blind and wondering, what in the world is going to happen to me in this world? Now, I, I, was a, I was a Pharisee. I'm not, I can't go back there. I was a member of the Sanhedrin. I was boasting and bragging. I wanted, to, I wanted to, you know, wipe these guys out. And now here I am. I'm one of them and I'm blinded. God was showing him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, I would love to sit here and tell you, and, and, and it's, been, it's been 
pumped up, you know, well, you know, become a follower of Jesus and, you know, we be smiling and be successful and everything. Well, you know, God can bless you that, those ways. But I'm telling you something. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. Take up your cross. I'm not saying we've got to go look for problems, okay? I'm not saying we've got to go. Sometimes we make our own crosses. But Jesus said, take up my cross and follow me. People get that mixed up. We, we got a whole weird interpretation of Christianity in the United States of America. We don't understand that there's a cost to the call. He says, I'm going to show him the great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it, has been, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose he was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at, this, at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't take a course. He, didn't, he went out. He realized that where he was once an enemy of Christ, he now had to be the mouthpiece, the mouthpiece of Christ. Now, I know, and I've said this before, today, somebody wants to join a church, they've got to take a class. They've got to go through... Look, it's not about that. It's about the call that God puts in our lives. This Apostle Paul, Saul, his name was changed later, became the great church planner. What happened, if you, if you put the whole thing together, and if you read, he, he like, he, he was in Damascus, he was witnessing, he had to, they had to let him down in a basket because there were people that wanted to kill him there. But he got out of there, and he went into the wilderness, and it was about maybe 10 or 12 years before he actually started to minister, okay? I want you to turn with me now to Acts chapter 13. And there's a lot of time between these, these chapters here, but Look at Acts chapter 13. Now that Paul is called, and he's equipped, filled with the Holy Spirit, now we're going to see that his call is recognized. So if you have a call, you know what? It'll be recognized. Look at chapter 13. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord, now this Antioch was several miles north of Jerusalem. It actually became the center of the church. Uh, at first, Jerusalem was like the center of the church, but then they, they were persecuted and they moved. So Antioch became like the center of the Christian church. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have, what? Called then. It had been a number of years. Saul was established in the faith. God called him to salvation. He told him the things he was going to have to suffer. Now he's called him to the work. Okay? We're all called to a work. Paul was called to be a church planner and an apostle. We might not be called to be an apostle. We, you know, the word apostle actually means called, sent one. You might not be called to be an apostle or a pastor. You might not be called to Africa or to Germany or Asia. You might be called to next door. But we're all called. If you're a believer, you're called. And as they recognized his call, as they fasted and prayed and ministered unto God, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. This is an ordination service. You know, in, in, in organizations like the Church of God, people get called to ministry. You know what? The church doesn't call anybody to ministry. Pastors don't call people to ministry. Overseers don't call people to ministry. We're called by the Holy Spirit. That's who calls us to ministry. And when a church recognizes a call, they will ordain a minister or a pastor. That piece of paper I have that says ordained 
bishop on it. It, it, has, it has some value, but when it comes right down to it, it's just a piece of paper. You know, people, you can get that piece of paper and not really be called. There are people who have learned how to get through the system. I know a few of them. <laughs> and, they can, and they can get that piece of paper. And they say, man, I got the piece of paper. It's not worth anything if the call isn't behind it. Amen? Okay. So we see that Paul was called, and then he was called and sent. The church endorsed him. The, the, the ministers of the church endorsed him. Now I want, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 records what we call Paul's second missionary journey. Okay? And if we drop down, uh, look at verse... Look at verse 4. Let's start with verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they delivered the, the decrees for to keep and were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So they went through planting churches, ordaining elders in the churches, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Okay, now verse 6. Now this area they're talking about today, if you would look at a map, it would be the nation of Turkey. That would be the nation that they would be in. Okay. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, they wanted to go east to Asia, but the Holy Spirit said, no, don't go there. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 7. And they, when they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered that, don't go there. Don't go east. Don't go north. And a vision, uh, when they passing by My Mysia, in verse 8, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia. Now here's where we really want to land here. They, 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 they tried to go to one place, the Holy Spirit said no. They tried to go another place, the Spirit said, uh-uh. So there they are wondering, God, what do you want from me? And Paul got a vision. A vision of a man of Macedonia. And the man in Macedonia said, Come over and help us. Come over. What a prayer. Come over and help us. And it says in verse 10, And after he had seen the vision, Well, let's pray about it for a few weeks. No. You know why they didn't have to pray about it? Because they had been praying about it. See, they, they prayed every day. <laughs> they didn't have to, when, when God would show them something, say, well, you know, look, if we pray every day, you know what? We're going to be sensitive to hear what God says. That's what, that's what, you know, that's our problem. We don't give God two minutes, and then we get in a jam, and we start praying, oh, God, I need to hear from you. I need to. If we prayed to him every day, maybe we would hear from him when we got in a jam. Now, if we pray every day, maybe we wouldn't get in a jam. <laughs> okay. All right, now, immediately, it says, We endeavored to go into Macedonia as surely, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Had called us. There's a calling again, okay? Now, therefore, loosing from Troas, he recounts the trip. Uh, look at verse 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding many days. Uh, and on the Sabbath, uh, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spoke unto the woman which resorted there. And a certain woman, in verse 14, named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us. Uh, the Lord opened her heart, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of. And they found a place to stay. They found a place to pray. They made some disciples. The gospel was going forth. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful of the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So, we say, things are going, oh, man, this must be the Lord. Because he told us to go to Macedonia. We went to Macedonia. We meet some folks. They get saved. We got a place to stay. We got a little church. We got some prayer going on. It's, man, this must be God. Right? Okay, now, verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer. You reading that with me? A certain damsel 
possessed with a spirit of divination. A demon possessed young lady who would speak. It, it would be like, you know, we, we have prophets in the church that speak the word of God. She was Satan's prophet. She was a satanic prophet. She would speak the words of Satan. It says that she brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. She was, it was a good racket, okay? The same followed Paul. Now listen to what this soothsayer was saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Now, if that had been me, I might have said, Praise the Lord! We got a man, we got this, we got this, this devil worshiper. Man, maybe Satan shaking in his boots. But Paul must not have been too thrilled with this. You, you know, you know that old saying, if you can't beat them, join them? Yeah, Satan will come along for the ride. Just the, here's this woman, this young lady, who had a, she had a reputation for being a mouthpiece of Satan, and she is, she is uh, endorsing. You know what? I don't need Satan to, to endorse my ministry. Let's see, you might, might as well think about this for a minute. I do not need Satan to endorse my ministry. I don't need the world to pat me on the back and say, you're doing a good job. When they start doing that, I start getting scared. <laughs> she said, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Well, that's the truth, isn't it? Yes. Well, they, they were. But coming from the mouth of Satan, it would work to do nothing but to pull down the work of the gospel. So if you try to mix, if you try to mix the things of God with the things of Satan, you're not going to pull them up. They'll pull you down. I could go a whole road here, but I'm not. <laughs> you know, we try, we want to, we want to, we want to get people in church by playing the music they like to hear. You know, See, God dealt with me about, I, I'll be honest with you now, see, I've, been, I've been doing this worship, playing music for a long time. And we used to play some songs that, that I don't want to play no more. Because God let me know it was not glorifying to him. I'll, I'll let it go. At that. We can't, we can't bless God with sinful things. Okay? It's quiet. Man, there's, there's church playing secular music for their worship service. How can that, how can that be? How can that, how can that, how can you glorify God by playing music written by people that worship, worship the devil? This what's going on. They pack them out, too. They pack them out. They got the, they got the amps and the smoke flowing and everything and, brrr, and the lights and the strobe lights going. And just like I used to do down at Civic Rio when we used to go see them concerts down there before I was saved. And when we used to go see that stuff, they had brrr, the lights and the smoke, you know. And they figured, man, that would bring them in. They bring them in. You bring them in and send them out the same way they came in. I'm not, okay, that's enough of that. Now look, now look at verse 8. Maybe worse, that's right. Verse 18. And this did she many days. Paul put up with it for a while. But Paul, being grieved, turned to the Spirit. I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And when, you know, he didn't have to jump up and down and scream and yell and have a, a seance going on. All he did was say, in the name of Jesus, come out. And you know what happened? That little girl was set free. Sometimes we make, sometimes we make such a big deal out of something that would just take... But you see, the thing is, he was prayed up. See, we want to, you know, I've, I've, known pe I've known people that want to get into, like, deliverance ministry, quote-unquote, you know. And they want to go cast the devils out of people. And the thing is, they don't, they don't give God two minutes until somebody comes up and says, I need the devil cast out. And they try to cast the devil out. You know, we need to be praying every day. We need to be ready at any time. All Paul did, he was just turn around and said, come out of her. He didn't have to jump up and down and scream and hold her down. And it just it came out. Because the word, of, the word of God has authority. Right? So, she got delivered. Hallelujah. Man, things are going good in Philippi. 
Well, that prayer, man, we got that vision. Come and help us. We came over, found a place to stay, started a church, cast the devil out of a young girl. Wow. God's really moving. And when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, what did they do? They caught Paul and Silas, and they drew them into the marketplace under the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to what? To, oh, wait a minute. So you've got a church, got people, got Christians, cast out the devil. Now, they're getting beat up by, by the officials. This wasn't just a bunch of thugs on the street. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stalks. Now, I don't know about you, but had I been one of them, had that been like me and Jairus, and after I got beat up, I'd probably turn to Jairus and say something like, maybe we should have prayed a little bit more about this thing. <laughs> Because now all of a sudden, man, things are going good. God's moving. Now all of a sudden, for doing something righteous, they end up beat up and locked up in jail. And they didn't have air conditioning back then. And it says, now, again, what I think I would have done, you know, the way I complain about stuff, right? But listen to what they did. We know the story. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, what did they do? They pray. You know, this prayer thing, it's going on all through the same. We, we need to pray every day. I mean, I thank God we get together in church and we pray in intercessory prayer and prayer breakfast and all these other things. That's great. But we need to pray ourselves every day. We need to have conversations with God. We need to not only tell Him what we think we need, but we need to listen for Him to tell us what He knows we need. See, we want to be able to witness and cast out the devil and do these things, but we don't want to pray. If you're not praying, don't try to do any of that stuff. Pray first. Pray first. They sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Verse 26, And suddenly there was a, a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Amen. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself. Why? Because in the Roman Empire, if somebody, if a, if a prisoner was under your guard, and you let them escape, you would have to bear their, their punishment. So in other words, if you were guarding a murderer and they were scheduled to be crucified for committing murder and they escaped, you would be crucified. So when the, when the, when the jailer heard that all the doors were open and all the prisoners, he's thinking like, I might as well end it now. He pulled out his sword and would have killed himself supporting that the, uh, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Now, now listen, I just put this together. Was this that man that was crying for help? We don't know about that vision. We're not told who the man was in the vision. But here was a man right here. A Roman soldier. He didn't ask to be put in that position of thinking that he let all the prisoners escape. But here he is ready to kill himself. And Paul says, we're here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's the bottom line. Right here. If there wasn't another person in Macedonia that had been saved, this one man said, what must I do to be saved? Now, if you could put all this together, and we're going to close. We, we, got, we prepared the Lord's table. The call, the call, the call. And those who hear the call and answer and are faithful and pray and are willing to go wherever God tells them to go and take whatever's going to come 
for the sake of one man's life. Now, there were other people saved, of course. And I'm not saying that that jailer was that man that said, come and help us. I'm not saying that. But if he had been just one man, just one soul, the Apostle Paul gave up everything he ever thought was important so that he could go to the mission field, plant churches, save souls, teach and preach the gospel, write the doctrinal books of the New Testament that tell us what, what to believe and how to act. All because he was willing. I want to ask you this morning. Are you willing to answer the call? See, I, you know, I got a phone call. Come to Germany and marry me. I didn't have to pray about that. <laughs> there are people in this neighborhood. Oh, this, is, this is a challenging neighborhood. To say the least. My church is here and I live here. A guy went past my house the other night going 80 miles an hour. I'm glad I wasn't there to see it. You've read about it in the newspaper. Another guy on the other side of Dre Street. Up there. <laughs> you know, we hear, we hear about this, this going on and on. We see, we see people on this, kids up and down this street. You know, walking up to the store, hanging out on a street corner. It might turn out to be a long, hot summer. But you know what? They're calling. Help, help us. Help us. They don't even know they need help. But they're calling. Help us. Help us. Why are we here? You know. We, we come together. I, I love having church. I love seeing you all. Communion. Why are we here? They're screaming, help us. Do you hear the call? Do you see the vision? You know what? You go, and it might be in your neighborhood. It might not be here. It might be where you live. They're saying, help us. It might be on your job. That The lost out there are saying, help me. These kids. We have kids come in for the, you know, the touched by God and kids come in Sunday morning for Sunday school. They're saying, help me. There was a time in my life when I had to say, help me. I can't. Help me. And I thank God. God, help me. How many people say the same thing? There was a time when I needed help. And he helped me. Now, the call is there. See, it's not about church on Sunday morning. I thank God for church. I, I, want, I, I love church on Sunday morning. Preach, hear the word, fellowship, shake hands, pray, have communion. Encourage one another in the faith. Assemble yourself together. That's what the word says. Don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. That's important that we come together and encourage and pray for one another and pray for God's move. But there's a lost and dying world saying, help me. It was a Macedonian call for Paul. But it's a call for every one of us. Are you willing to answer the call? You know, you might get beat up. You might get beat up. See, I, I, get, I get so tired of... And I said this, I was... We were watching the latest uh, telephone, you know. And the, and the guys get on there, and they start, they start doing the money thing, the success. Six, the one guy on there called himself a success coach. You know what? They don't need a success coach. They need the gospel. They don't need a motivational speaker to tell them how to succeed in business. They need somebody to tell them how to get saved. They need, to, they need somebody to tell them how their lives can be turned around. How they can get themselves out of the hole they dug for themselves. I, I was in a hole. Were you ever dug in a hole and it looked like you could never get out? The only way out of that hole is through faith in Jesus Christ. So we keep trying to dig it deeper. We think by digging it deeper, we're going to get ourselves out. That's what the world teaches. But I'm here to tell you, they need to put their shovels down and to look up. 
and say, God, get me out of this hole. You know what? He'll take him out of that hole. Yes. He took me out of a hole once or twice in my life. And, that's where, and, he'll t and he's taken you out. And he'll take them out. That's what they need to hear. Do you hear the call this morning? Yes. To go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Teach them all the things I've taught you. That's what Jesus told his disciples. He said, all authority is given unto me. I'll never leave you. When, when Paul and Silas were in that prison locked up, Jesus was right there with them. That's why they could pray. That's why they could praise. Jesus was right there with them. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You have nothing to be afraid of. Are you willing to hear and answer that call today? I'm not in ministry just to put a rev in front of my name. You know, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. But my prayer is that we could make a difference. He got this church right here. And somebody said this morning, we were talking on the front porch, and somebody said, this is a good place for this church to be. It's a real good place for this church to be. I ain't ready to move out in the country. Yeah? I'm not going to go buy land out in the middle of nowhere. Would have been, you know, it'd be nice if we had a parking lot, no steps. Well, maybe God will give us that someday. But this is a good place for this church to be. Because there's a whole bunch of people out here saying, help me. Help me. They walk past her every day. God, use us to make a difference right here. Right here. There's some folks called to go other places. That's great. But we're right here. I want to make a difference here. If you're not concerned about making a difference here, okay. You know, it's your choice. But I'm, I'm stating, my, I'm stating my, my purpose. You know, our, our motto for the church is building the body of Christ. My purpose is I want to make a difference on Catalpa Street. I want to make a difference to the lives. If it's one or two lives here, I, you know, well, what a youth group. Walks up and down the street every day. You have to think about that. What a youth group of kids out here. Are you willing to answer the call? Are you willing to answer the call? It's God's call. It's not mine. It's His call. He cares about them a whole lot more than we do. Are we willing to stop resisting? Somebody might want to mention to the kids that we're going to get ready to take communion. Thank you. We have prepared the Lord's table. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to come and uh, partake. Before we do, I want to pray. How many people want to hear and answer the call? You know, you might say, I'm not, I'm a nobody, I can't speak, I can't preach. I, I, didn't, ask, I, I didn't ask all that. Ananias couldn't do any of that stuff. But he answered the call. It might be to one person. It might be to a whole generation. I want to pray.